All right, so just to continue, to continue, this particular verse says a couple of interesting things. And here we're at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. And let's focus on verse 1, which says, I exhort, or I advise, in Mekarallo, I advise, therefore, that first of all, supplications, one, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then it says in verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And so in our message, we say, you know, we should pray for Obama. Not just because he's the first African-American president. We should also pray for Bloomberg and, and, and any of these so-called temporal authorities or rulers. Of course, many will disagree because they have a faulty idea of what prayer is about or, or who they are and, and why it even says here in the scriptures that, that, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. See, for, for them, prayer is, 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 is like being... Uh, captivated like being by being a captive like prayers prayers are weakening some somehow it's a weakening thing or it's an inferior thing i don't know exactly what they have in mind but when they contradict the plain the plain the peshat of the scriptures it proves that they don't know the truth like they might claim to this is why christ says you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of god so we have to understand this in this context this is why we broke this down right here. So let's get to this right here. So the first thing that's mentioned is what we call Bamarinya in the Amharic, Limena, or Limena, Limena, which is supplication. Then we have Elot, which is prayers. Now, actually it's singular, it's supplication. King James add that S to it, but in the language it is singular. King James does, it, does this a lot. In, in the King James Version, some things are in the plural while in the Amharic or in the original it is it is singular. Now it says milja, milja is intercession, but they have intercessions here. Then misgana, misgana right here is the giving of thanks. The, the giving of thanks. Now here we have Tainayis Alin goes from our earlier teaching and we kept this up here. But these are the four that we want to focus on right here. Now it says that supplications, prayers intercessions and giving of thanks. Now, we mentioned this before. We don't know if you've been able to get a copy or if they're even still offering any copies of this. This was what's called the New Testament Recovery Bible. The Recovery Bible is a is an excellent um, companion reference, and we want to use this and, and present this into, um, into evidence right here. And when we get to chapter chapter 2, where it has, it says prayer. This is a footnote right here, and we think that it's appropriate for us to um, meditate upon this. It says that a prayer ministry is the prerequisite for administrating and shepherding of a local church. In other words, a prayer ministry is the prerequisite for the administrating and shepherding of a local church. It says concerning the difference between petitions and prayer, it says, see note 6, six squared or 6-2 in Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to go there in the next in the next part of it, but we're going to stick in Timothy, Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 2 for right now. The next footnote, it says the Greek word, the Greek word which is um, concerning... Um, um, I think godliness, it says the, the Greek word denotes an approaching of God in a personal and a confiding manner. And intervening, oh, okay, for intercession, the word for intercession. And intervening, it says, and interfering before God in others' affairs for their benefit. So intercession needs to be understood. And we're going to clarify the context of, of intercession because intercession is actually an intercessory prayer. Now, many may think these are different things, but we're going to show how all of these come together in a system, in, in God's own system. But when we read this here, because of 2,000 plus years and a lot of other whitewashing and, and, and confusions, 
a lot of this is not understood in its proper holistic. In other words, how does all this work together? You understand? For for the good. Next it says a quiet and a peaceable life is one that is peaceable still without disturbance, not only outwardly in circumstances, but also inwardly in our heart and spirit. Such a life enables us to have an enjoyable church life in godliness and gravity. Now we need to make no mistake about it because Rastafari, Rastafari in spirit and truth is a church. You understand? Know is the church, we can say, but is a church. So now when it explains even godliness, it's worthy of note right here. It says godly god likeness, god likeness being like God, expressing God, the spirit of truth. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Christian life should be a life that expresses God and bears God's likeness in all things. Secondly, a quality of human character that is worthy of reverence. It implies dignity and inspires and honors God where it says gravity or in your Bible's honesty. I, I would translate from them hard more as seriousness. A seriousness, a quality of human character that is worthy of reverence. It implies dignity and inspires and invites honor. Then there's another note for, to Philippians chapter 4 that, that is mentioned here. So we're going to touch on Philippians chapter 4 as what Hawari of Alos is explaining here to his disciple Timothy is already touched on in an earlier epistle to the Philippians. It goes on to say that God likeness is the expression of God, gravity, gravity is towards man, or honesty, as in the King James Bible says, a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So that honesty, which could be better translated as gravity, or as we translate, bamarinya, kamarinya, as seriousness, chimitinet, chimitinet, to have a seriousness. This is speaking of godliness, is the expression of God and gravity, is toward men, toward other people, to have a seriousness. Our Christian life or our Rastafari life should express God, the King of Kings, toward man with an honorable character that invites man's reverence. And it's interesting because Rastafari does not mean head creator. It means the head to be reverence. So here we're getting a full cipher in the context of Scripture with nothing being added and nothing being taken away. Now, let's go, to, let's go to the next quote that we have here, which is very important, just to lay a basic foundation to this teaching. And the next quote that we have is, what a Philippians, uh, Sawoch, or Philippians. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Philippians chapter Four, verse 6, and we're going to deal with the King James version of this firstly, but the Amharic and the King of Kings teaching for mostly. Um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, and here it says, chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let, let your or make your request be made known to God. It says, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let or make your request be known to God. Now, in the Schofield Study Bible, this is in the chapter, chapter 4 of Philippians, which is part 4, and it says Christos, the Moshiach, the Mitmenon, the, quote, believer, end quote, or the admittance strength, rejoicing over anxiety, to rejoice over anxiety. None of us can avoid these anxious days and perilous times, but we can spiritually transmute that and rejoice over the anxiety. Now, prayer, understanding what it is, is the key. Prayer is the key. Now, this particular chapter is also now 
has a footnote here where it says, exhortation to unity, to unity and joy. And, um, you know, the season that we're in now, we're about to approach, we're, we're, we're between, we're like in the five days, I think the second or third, no, third or, or so day um, between um, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and uh, Sukkot. And we had mentioned earlier um, to ones and ones with I and I that, you know, this season, seeing what the season is for us, and we are so scattered and divided and and, and we're not able to really to really uh, come together and rejoice in, in, in this season as we should. And, and that separation from our brothers and sisters of the faith, many of you out there who regularly tune in, watch, and learn, and study, and are growing with us, it seems to build some sort of, even on a small level, of depression. I don't know if some of you all feel the same way, but it's like because we cannot gather or, or, or have not yet, rather, not that we cannot, but we have not yet come together and, and been able to gather and really live our way of life, seeing that we're coming through so much trials and tribulation as we wash our garments in the blood of the Lamb, speaking esoterically, not exoterically. Um, this chapter is, is, is perfect. It's right on the mark because here it says, Therefore, my brethren, Dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in Adonai, my dearly beloved. I mean, this, though the English, the English captures it to some extent, but this in the essence of what Hawadi Aulos is saying. He's saying, after everything else he said before in chapters 3 and 2 and 1, he says, therefore, my brethren, Dearly, dearly beloved, not just beloved, but dearly beloved and longed for. Not only loved, but longed for. In other words, where Hawadi Aulos was at, he was in a sense, one could say, he was in a bad spot, just like we are. You know, he was in a bad spot. There was, there was a lot of trials and tribulation and separation. And he longed for his brothers and sisters in the true faith of the King of Kings and his Christ. He, he calls them, my joy and crown, because he had worked so diligently towards helping to build up their faith and to teach them the true teachings of the apostolic doctrine. So now here he's about to speak on brotherhood. Now I want you to pay attention, understanding what we just touched on in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 42, in the first part of this. He says, so stand fast, in other words, stand firm. In Adonai. In other words, now that you've learned and grown in this, don't weaken up, but stand firm in Adonai, my dearly beloved, reinforcing how much, how much he loved the brothers and the sisters, the true family. Because, see, we're not just a church. The Bible says we are a family. You know what I'm saying? We are a household. You know what I'm saying? This is a household. Rastafari is not just you know, just, just a bunch of people who smoke weed and, and dreadlocks and go to reggae concerts. That, that is a perversion, just like there was early perversions in the early Christian church. And Hawadi Apollos was one who pointed out many, the crux of these matters, which still, ironically, if we look at it, we can apply the same spiritual logic to remedying these things that we face even today as Rastafari, both personally and corporately. But he now makes a a special beseechment. He says, I beseech you, Odias, and beseech uh, Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in Adonai. You know, he said, I'm begging you. And, 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 and this beseeching, if we would understand it, is a limina. Limina, like a limine, bamarinya, is like a beggar. But he's saying, I'm beseeching. You know, just as a beggar, one who is unfortunate, whether their own acts or somebody else's acts they don't have, just as they would beg for a quarter, a nickel, dime, or whatever, food, is the same way that we will supplicate the true God, the God of truth, Hashem, Ha Elohim, Baruchu, is the same way that we would beseech one another. You know, when you when you really love somebody and you and you're begging them. To, to hear you, to heed you, you understand, even for their own good, to understand what is the true spiritual, the hardicle 
uh, motivation, the modus operandi that must come from within. You understand? It's not outside in, but it's inward projecting out where the true light comes from. Now, he says to Euodius, Euodius and Syntyche, or, the, or Syntyche, you understand? He's saying to these, these two that they be of the same mind of the same spiritual mind. See, and being of the same mind means that we're in the same teaching. We're in the same good news. We're in the same, we're on message. We're in the same message. Not two and three minds about it. You understand? Therefore, if the church stayed on that foundation, there would not be all these denominations, all these little, these, these cults in so-called Christianity. Because each one of them that has a separate name other than church, basically... <laughs> Is, is some other thing than what Christ said. You know, this was a Methodist, this one Catholic, this one said this one is a Protestant, this is this, this, this. All that's nonsense. What they've done is divide, you understand, they've divided the, the equal brotherhood, just like the priest divided the priest from the laity. It was never so, and it was never intended to be so. Therefore, they have lost that same mind in Adonai. You understand, in other words, it's the same mind in his word and in his teaching. Not talking about um, being the same mind with, with this group of people who you get down with because of advantage or something like that. No, being the same mind in his truth. Verse 3 says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. In other words, true yoke fellows, fellows who are in the same yoke. Notice in the King James um, Bible and the, and the Scofield here, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Yoke fellow. Now, where, where, where do we come across this word yoke in, in, in the teachings of Christ? Do you remember? And, and it's the very same teaching as the teaching of his imperial majesty. And it's that quote that Matthew makes that is found here in St. Matthew's chapter 11. It's the new message of Yeshua. It's the new message of Jesus. It, at this time, it wasn't the kingdom. Like for us, our message is... Initially, is not the kingdom, but we see what's happened to the kingdom of the king of kings. You understand? It has not been destroyed, but it's on hold. The new message is personal discipleship. It's personal discipleship. And here's where we find the come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in the heart. Or he says, to hoot. But libe, to hoot. I am tut. I am to hoot in heart. And ye shall find rest to your souls or for your souls. Really, rest to your souls. My yoke, verse 30, is easy and my burden is light. To say my burden is not heavy. So here he says, take my yoke. In other words, it's like the yoke that will be used. It's like the priests use this thing called nowadays, well, actually it's been going on for a couple of days now, the collar. Like, you know, when the priest will have the priest's collar, that's a yoke. You understand? That's a yoke right there. That's a symbolic, in a sense, yoke. But now, in order to really understand the importance of this yoke, we do have to go to the ancient Egypt to understand the original types. This is why Christ went into Egypt, if you know, and the son was called out of Egypt, just as we have to take wit and wisdom from that. That original yoke is like the animal, it's like the cow, it's like the bull, you understand, that has that particular yoke. And if you recall, David could not bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem initially. It had to stay at Obed, Edom's place, because he did it his way, and he didn't do it Yah's way. Finally, when he understood, he went to the priest, and he went to the scripture, he recognized that he was to have two, two, um, two, two bulls that, that never knew yoke, and to yoke them, and the Almighty would guide them spiritually. But these had to be two, two bulls that never was under any yoke, that, that never had to plow any land, because when David tried the first time and, and the man had tried to prevent the Ark of the Covenant ostensibly from falling and he died and everybody was afraid and so forth and so on, and David didn't want to bring the Ark to his house until he found out that Ebed-Odem 
uh, or obeyed at them, you understand, was, 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 was profiting that the ark actually stayed at a regular person's house, in a regular person's barn, actually at, at a regular person's barn. And then David later on heard that this guy is not, you know, he's not dying from this. He's profiting from it. Then David said, I must have been doing something wrong. And he went, sure enough, he went to the priest. He put on the ephod. You know, ephod. You know he went to the priest, and he found out that there was a certain order. And I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, same thing with us. We've been wandering around the same old mountain and molehill for the last 40 years. A whole generation has almost perished. The last, the oldest of them are holding on. Maybe we'll have a couple of Caleb's and Joshua's, but for the most part, a whole generation over the past 40 years because they've been doing it their way but not Yah's way, and they've been deceived by the so-called dream that, that, the, that had nothing to do with God's will for this people. And see Jeremiah chapter 23 for more on the folly and the fakery of the so-called nigger dream. You understand that? That was all fake. I hate to tell you that, but that's the truth. Now, let's move back here to so the yoke is what we wanted to connect, that yoke. So here, Hawadi Apollos is saying, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. That means we are all in the same yoke. Just as, that, just as, the, as, the, as the oxen that were to bring the Ark of the Covenant had to be, in a sense, virgin oxen, at least to the plowing of the land. And Yahweh said that his spirit would guide the ox, and nobody had to pull the ark or whatever, but he would even show that this is his divine will, that he would guide this, these ox. And this is what it means when it says, don't be unequally yoked. You see what I'm saying? When, and, 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 there's, and there's a lot to this right here, but when he says, don't be unequally yoked, the key word, of course, is yoke. Here, Hawadi Apollos is saying, the Apostle Paul is saying, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. Now, why do you have to say true? Because even in his time, there were fake yoke fellows. Ones that said they were, were, were equally yoked, but actually they were, they were, um, they already been plowing the false ground. You know what I'm saying? They were not virgin in that sense. You know what I'm saying? But he's saying to the true yoke fellow, he's saying, help those women. Help those women. This takes away a lot of the sexism that you hear some misled sisters and brothers talking about all oh, the Bible the sexism or some garbage like that. Here, Hawaii Apollo saying, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. He's acknowledging on the record that there were those women who had labored with him in the gospel, in the good news of the King of Kings and his Christ. And it says, with Clement, Clement, or Clement of Alexandria, Clement also, and Clement, this is the interesting thing about when we say that Paul was a Gnostic, Clement was a Gnostic as well, too. And what's interesting, if you can get your hands on some of the writings of Clement, the early church writings, it is so beautiful. You understand how he further expands on this same truth that the Romanists would pervert and twist, and the Protestant will only halfway untwist but leave it halfway twisted, and that would come down to us today in all these kind of demon nominations, Southern Baptists, uh, Pentecostes, and the rest of them that we would get to this very day. But he says, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Now, what's so interesting about this? Yom Kippur, all was speaking about and preparing us for the time when our names will be inscribed, into the book of life. And then now after that, five days, there'll be a five-day pause, and then we're coming into the Sukkot, Sukkot, which is in gathering. So we see that the subject matter, when we're able to now spiritually understand it, we see there's a, there's a connection, that there was a context that the first century Christians were speaking in, and that was a Judah-ish or a Hebrew context, or what they would, for lack of a better word, a Jewish or Ethiopian Hebrew context. He says, rejoice in Adonai always. And again, I say rejoice, because after Yom Kippur, which is a, a time of an affliction of the soul, there was now the Sukkot, which was the ingathering of tabernacles time, and was a time of rejoicing. Now, this section from verses 5 to 7, which we are mainly focusing on for this matter of prayer, 
is subscribed in the Schofield as the secret of the peace of God. The secret of the peace of God. Now you might understand why in Second Epistle of John, I think around verse 10 and verse 10 and 11, it says that ones who don't bring this teaching, don't wish them Godspeed or don't wish them Salaam. Basically, don't wish them shalom, because shalom is the peace of God. Now, here is the secret of this peace of God. It says, let your moderation, let your moderation be known. Let's see, moderation, it has an S next to this. It says gentleness or garnet, really, bamarinya garnet malet, uh, tameness. You know, like you have a wild donkey or a wild horse when that horse has been tamed. It is garnet. It has moderation. Let your gentleness, in other words, or moderation, be known to all men, whether they are, are, are black Hebrew or they are, they are black Gentile or, or other Gentiles. Let it be known to all. It says the Lord, or Adonai, geta karbano, that the, the master is at hand. The master is nearby. Be careful for nothing. In other words, don't be anxietous. The idea here is don't be anxietous. This connects with Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, and 1 Peter chapter uh, 5, verse 7. So you know, this idea of where he says don't be anxious, don't be anxietous. See, because too much anxiety breeds a mental disorder. And then one has to then take the pharmaceuticals or the sorceries of Babylon, which is now, you know, the, the revel, on Revelation says be, be aware of their sorceries. The sorcery is their big farmer. So if you don't follow God's way, you're going to fall, you understand, from that grace, even by being a so-called Christian, if you don't understand what this really means. It says be careful for nothing is don't be anxietous. Because too much worldly seclorum anxiety, it leads to mental dysfunction. You understand? And then these mental dysfunction either... Either they're going to they're gonna force drugs on you or give these drugs to you voluntarily and, and put you in a, in a crazy house. And among black folks, a lot of folks end up in the crazy house. And part of it is because they were careful for everything. They got anxietous, like, what is my life? What am I going to wear? What am I going to eat? About status, out of, like a lot of niggas today, looking at, you know, like people on the Internet and Facebook, and like, oh, my goodness, somebody said something. They wouldn't friend me, and, they, and they're going crazy. You see, they, they are anxietous for everything. They are careful for everything. But the word of truth tells us, be careful for nothing. Be careful for, for nothing. But in everything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with, along with thanksgiving. Now, we're going to learn a very important connection to empowering our prayers. It says, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let your requests be, known, be made known to God. Now, some fools, well, they're fools who contradict this truth. They'll say, well, if God knows everything already, why do I have to tell him? Like, he can read my mind. He's, he's not no magician, not no game player. See, this really shows our obedience. You, you know what I mean? It shows our obedience. If, if somebody in the world, if, if your worldly rulers and authorities in your bank tells you to do the same thing, you'll do it. But if the Almighty, the source of your life, the life giver tells you to do it, you'll question it. You, you'll question whether he really exists. The question is, do you really exist? Or really, after this, will you really exist? That's the real question. But it says, furthermore, in verse 7, and the peace of God, the peace of God. Forget about Zen. Forget about Nirvana. Get the shalom of Yahweh, the peace of Elohim, of Ha Elohim, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts, shall keep your hearts, right, and minds. It's a head and a heart campaign, right? Keep your heart and your mind through Christos Jesus, through the Moshiach, Yehoshua, the peace of God. This, this tranquility, this, this peace, this is why we cannot wish God speed on ones that we know don't have the doctrine. We, first of all, have to seek to teach them if they're teachable. If they're not teachable, 
and they don't want to hear the teaching of his majesty, then allow them to go to hell. Please don't, don't encourage them, don't push them, but allow them to go through that. Because some people need to go through bad experiences. You, like Once you have, have sought to present the truth to them, and they say, I don't believe in that. Well, did you hear what I said? You heard? Okay, good, great. God, do what you do. Do what you want to do. But it'll be better for you. You understand? If you made your will obedient to good influences, you understand, and avoid evil, you understand. But at least testify. You understand? But don't be running. A lot of you are going crazy running after folks, you know, because they're your flesh and blood or something like that. that see, that's that is another part of this. Why Christ said, if you love. Mother, father, sister, brother, whatever, you know, saying more than me, you're not worthy of me. That means you don't really understand how spiritual spiritual is. You don't really, you're not able to perceive the real reality. And it's a shame when men and people are on those sort of levels, but that's their choice. Now, it gives us some more instruction concerning the presence of God and the God of peace. You understand? Which to I and I is beyond any of this little metaphysical or this this new age crap. They got a lot of new age crap teaching, you understand, out there, which takes little bits and pieces of this, but all denies the divinity of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. That means it may have a limited, you know, a limited benefit, you understand, but it won't be able to sustain and keep head and heart, you understand, in this time of great tribulation, because really a lot of it, unless it's supplemented with drugs and stuff, it's not able to. But here's the next part that we want to touch on, because we can go into this a little bit more, but there's more to this particular chapter. We want to focus on the secret of the peace of God, the secret of the peace of God and the power of prayer. So, brothers and sisters, stay tuned. Don't go nowhere. Stay tuned. Shalom. Rasta Fabio.